Welcome students of the University of Alberta in Edmonton in Canada. I am Anna Saranti and together with Professor Andreas Holziger I will present the details of the practical part of the Explainable AI lecture. I will talk about how can we explain neural networks and their predictions with layer-wise relevance propagation. This is a method that it's invented and developed by the group of Klaus Robert Müller at the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, I personally I am employed by the Medical University of Graz. I am not part of the University of Alberta and I've just finished my first year in, of my PhD studies that are supervised by Professor Holziger and have myself still many things to learn. The outline of my presentation today will contain the introduction and will go into the feed-forward neural network architecture, which is the most simple and first architectures that uh, were developed. For those of you who don't know, there will be books and literature provided by in the end of this video. For those that already know the details and training and bar propagation are known, you can feel free to repeat or just skip those this part. Um, Layerwise relevance propagation, shortly termed LRP for feed forward neural networks, will be presented. I will talk briefly about what were the goals, although Professor Holziger has already explained in his lecture what were the goals and how it is applied, what are the results, the so-called heat maps, but also I will go deeper into detail in the mathematical basis of LRP. Um, graph neural networks um, will be one of the hottest topics and state-of-the-art topics in the application and conferences as we see. I will present the main ideas um, still learning in this field and I think this is still a work in progress but nevertheless it was included in the lecture because of its importance. Um, you will have a small bonus task where you will build a graph neural network. Explainable AI methods of graph neural networks are still in development and we will not put so much emphasis this year on that but we still encourage everyone to learn about graph neural networks. Um, the task will have one main part and one bonus part. The bonus part is the creation of graph neural networks and the main part will be split in two parts. The first one you should uh, apply LRP on paper on a simple feedforward network and the second one will be to use the software that's developed by the Technical University of Berlin which is called Investigate in Python um, and to see for yourself what are the heat maps, what do the explanations produced by this um, software do. So let's talk briefly about fully connected neural networks. This is the simplest possible architecture and one of the first for the supervised learning. Um, its simplest form is a classification. Let's assume that we have a set of images of cats and a set of images of cars and we want to train a feedforward uh, neural network um, to separate those two and classify those two correctly. So what do we see in this architecture? We see that we have one input layer and one output layer. Um, the images or any other input which can be numerically represented, it can be features like temperature, it can be um, also um, encoded um, categorical features like the size of um, uh, objects um, are inserted from the input layer and one can have as many hidden layers as one desires. Um, there are many layers, each layer containing a number of neurons denoted by circles. So each circle stands for a nonlinear activation function which is applied to end the input. Um, in this architecture, each neuron of each layer is connected with each one of the next, but each connection does not have the same weight. Um, not every input, let's assume in an image, has the same importance and doesn't play the same role for a prediction. 
Um, let's go back to the example of classification. The classifier can be trained on this data set of cats and cars, but to discriminate between cats and cars and say this is an image of a cat or this is an image of a car, um, and assuming the objects are centered properly and we don't have quality issues in our data set, um, this neural network should not put so much emphasis on the background of the images because they are in general not so significant for the differentiation between those two classes. So what does the training procedure do? The training procedure specifies the weights and um, I repeat that there's a linear combination of the inputs weighted by the learned weight which is fed at each neuron and the linear, then the linear, uh, non-linear, sorry, activation function is applied. So in general, the neural network computes overall a nonlinear function f of x, and um, for the sake and purposes of this lecture, let's assume that we go away from this classification scheme that I said before um, about separating between cars, images of cars and images of cats, and let's assume that we have different uh, type of two classes differentiation and let's assume that we have a training set containing one type of object let's assume that this can be um, a cat or it's a building and other types of images that don't contain that object and we can say that we want um, the output of the trained neural network to um, be zero when there's no object in the image and to be greater than zero if the object is recognized in the image with one particular degree of certainty that will be expressed by um, the uh, value of f of x. Um, the result of Lerwa's relevance propagation when applied to a convolutional network that typically process images um, is going to be the, the heat maps that we've also seen in the lecture of Professor Holzinger. I will not go into details about the architecture of convolutional neural networks right now. I just want to focus on the resulting heat maps and how do we try as humans to interpret them. What do we see? First of all, let's see um, the, what the data set is firstly all about. Um, the, this neural network was trained on the MNIST dataset, which classifies between handwritten digit images. So we have 10 classes from 0 to 9. So the neural network um, was trained on that. And after the training, we applied there was relevance propagation. And the heat maps show us what were the distinctive features of the images to discriminate between one class and the other. Uh, one example that one can observe uh, is that this zero is um, differentiated by its characteristic of having nothing in the, the, around the middle of the image, right? And it's very important to say that in case of classification, the parts that are highlighted, provided that we have a very good classification performance, is what discriminates one class images from the other class images. Meaning that if the data set is different and if the classes are different, then the heat maps may look different even if the architecture of the network is the same. The weights will be in general different and that's why we will have different heat maps. So those parts that are very, very intense red are the parts of the image that helped the network to say this is one because um, we have here an edge that's very good recognizable and we don't see this characteristic in the rest of the images of the rest of the classes. Um, some terminology that's very important here. We say that the network is fully connected and we have a feed-forward calculation after the training, but the training itself um, and the back propagation that it's used to train the network uses the error of its prediction uh, with the training data 
to compute and learn the parameters as we say. So what's happening is that the network is initialized with weights that are quasi random, but in the training procedure we compare what does it predict and what it with what it should predict according to the training data and then um, at some time point after many epochs um, until the performance in a whole dot validation set of data that hasn't be, hasn't been used in the training set is sufficiently good we stop the training procedure the weights are frozen and LRP is applied after the end of the training procedure. Now, unfortunately, the relevance propagation is going from the output layer to the input layer once. Um, and one shouldn't confuse the neural network training back propagation procedure where we have this feed forward backwards, feed forward backwards um, of the error with this. LRP one backward pass in the end of the training procedure, right? Um, one of the things that I also need to emphasize is that the training must have a good performance itself. So um, you as students and me also need to also think what uh, the heat map will look like if the performance of the neural network is not good. Can I trust this heat map? Um, is it good to follow um, the interpretations of the heat maps in such a case. And again, um, I can also show you this image what I've uh, explained briefly before about the forward and the backward pass. Um, this neural network has this fully connected architecture and it's confronted with lots of images containing a cat and not containing a cat. And there are a lot of forwards and backward passes when um, this uh, network is trained and in the end we uh, after the training this connections here have all their own individual weights and after that the relevance propagation just makes one backward pass from the output to the heat map and ideally if the performance is very good then we can see from the heat map that the background of this image didn't play a role for the classification of this image belonging to the class cat, but the characteristics of the cat itself was um, were very um, descriptive for the neural network to take its decision properly. Uh, one other thing that will be used um, in the rest of the lecture is that usually one layer is indexed by the index E and the layer immediately after that is indexed by the index J. So this is just a convention. Let's proceed now to the basic mathematical principle behind LRP, which is actually the Taylor decomposition. So the Taylor expansion of a function f of x um, is known to everybody at a point a near to x is presented uh, it's computed by this equation. Um, it uses the derivatives and the factorials of the function in this point A. And now the main idea of LRP was to take the classification output f of x of input x and forget about the higher order terms for the moment and put them all to um, a variable called epsilon and say, all right, if I have a root point, meaning in our case an image x of tilde, um, and also rewrite the first derivative as um, the partial derivatives of um, x in the point x equal to x tilde, then I can, assuming that I have found a root point that has classification zero, so this f of x tilde is zero, then I can write the output of the neural network only composed by the first derivatives of its pixel. And in general, I can say that each output of the layer uh, j uh, with respect to the relevances can be also written um, by this formula where E is the index of the previous layer. 
So just setting this um, part as the relevance of each pixel computes, assuming that I have found the root point, uh, the relevance of each pixel in the image. And I can make this also iteratively going from the output layer to the previous layer and the previous layer before and come back to a heat map. So how does it that look in practical terms? In practical terms we can think of one input containing a building and let's assume that the neural network um, classifies between images that contain the building and images that don't contain the building. And the main question is now what is the root point in such a case and how can we find it? Now, if we add some noise in the input image or if we just occlude parts of the building that are, were very decisive or we expect that were very decisive for the neural network to acknowledge this input and classify this input as containing the building, then we have found our root point. An image that is very similar to the original one but is classified as not containing the building and has an output of f of x is zero. Now we can compute the gradient at this point, we can compute the difference with the original image and we can produce the heat map. This is certainly a simplified version, it is just for demonstration and learning purposes, but it shows the basic idea of what is going on and how the ideas of LRP were um, developed by the Theo Berlin group. Um, and here is just another uh, um, presentation slide of what I said before of how to find a neighboring point. It seems to be quite easy, it's a bit more difficult than that, but nevertheless it's very important to know how in general one can do this. Now, LRP has also some very interesting properties and one can refer to the paper for the derivation of these properties. There are two of them that we expect for you to use them in the task. Um, the, for every image and for every input, the uh, sum of relevances in a particular layer are equal to the sum of the relevances in another layer, so we don't lose any relevance from layer to layer layer in general. And there's also the positivity um, property where we see that the relevance is in general uh, greater or equal than zero. Uh, how can we use them? I mean, um, we can use them uh, since we, com we can compute the relevance for a small enough neural network, we can use them for testing or validation purposes for our computations. Either we do it on paper or we create a program computing them, we can use them to do a validation like a unit test. Um, one other very important component of the neural network that will be used also in the task is the rectified linear unit or ReLU. In short, it's um, a function that's used typically in the activation of the, of the neural network and it has the following form as you see in the image and it can be found in all commercial and non-commercial uh, neural network building software and libraries like TensorFlow, Keras and PyTorch that we use in the institute. The example that will be used um, in the task for its solving uh, has a very very small neural network composed just from one input, one hidden layer and one output. Uh, this uh, part here denotes the ReLU function that I've shown you before and it shows that the activation function of the neurons in this hidden layer have this form. Um, all neurons in layer X are denoted by XI, all neurons in the network J, which is the hidden uh, a layer are uh, presented with xj and there's also the output neuron which is just one and the functionality between the neurons in the hidden layer j is just a sample it's just the sum of all previous outputs from um, the all the neurons here what's interesting in this image is that um, unfortunately for um, the purposes of depiction the authors didn't connect each neuron with uh, of 
this layer with the neurons of this layer and all neurons of this layer with the neurons of the output layer. Um, please uh, don't be irritated by that and go back to page three and see that there are connections from each layer to other layer. We had also students um, being irritated by this image. So the connections are there. This is a fully connected network. It's just that we haven't designed every connection um, that it's possible in the image. Um, you can see the weights here and you will use them for computation purposes. And um, yes, that's all that I have to say here. Oh, the relative nonlinearity is also written by this formula. The relevance of the output layer is since we have a sum pooling functionality is the sum of all the inputs of the previous layer. The relevance is then now back propagated to the hidden layer J and the Taylor decomposition on the root point zero. And here we can also see from those equations and since the ReLU um, ensures that the root point will have a greater or equal than zero um, value, we know that this root point will have all its components equal to zero is given by this equation. And if you go back to the input layer, there is a derivation and a rule that has to be applied to go from the relevance of the hidden layer to the relevance of the input layer that uses the weights, as one can expect, of those um, for uh, the connections of um, the input layer to the forward layer. The derivation is unfortunately out of scope for the purposes of this lecture, but it can nevertheless be read in detail in the papers that are listed in the literature section. You only need to follow those um, equations to compute the results of the exercise. Now let's go to talk briefly about the bonus task and how graph neural networks work. So for those who know convolutional networks, they are applied on grid structure data. Mostly they are images, but not necessarily. One can also have structures of text that are presented in a grid structured form. Um, but the main idea of graph neural networks is that we have data that are not necessarily grid structured and we can process them. Um, the graph neural networks is composed by lots of numbers of layers as we have seen in the fully connected case and as it holds also for uh, convolutional neural networks in general. There are T number of layers and it's very important that we shouldn't confuse t with time. We're not talking here about dynamical graphs. The graphs, input components, nodes and edges are represented by numerical features, um, which are, for example, in PyTorch uh, or in TensorFlow tensors, that are the input to the graph neural network. Um, each layer t transforms the features, so we have the first features inputted in the first layer and they are transformed until we reach this point here where we have h of t. And of course the graph neural networks has parameters that are learned, they are also presented with w as we've seen in the fully connected case. They are learned during training also called weights of the network, but should not be confused with the potential edge weights of the graph. Um, one important thing that I have to also say about graph neural networks is that edges and nodes can have, in general, different types of features. Um, and in that case, the graph is considered to be heterogeneous. In the other case, where every there's just one type of edge and one type of node features we can talk about a homogeneous graph and there are different training procedures for those two cases um, to specify the architecture of the graph neural network we use also different operators which are presented by different adjacency matrices and there are also different aggregation types for the embeddings of the nodes and the edges which are usually sums 
Um, it can be also multiplications and it's also um, a decision of the designer or th something that must be learned if one wants to work with crack neural networks. Here um, are the list of the things that I've said previously about graph neural networks. And uh, there is one um, Python library that we use in the Institute now to learn about graph neural networks and create our own, which is called DGL. It's also written in Python and uses as a backend PyTorch. And PyTorch uses as a backend uh, TensorFlow or MXNet. And I'll just briefly talk about how to initialize those graph neural networks. And you can also see that here also one has input features, hidden features, aggregation types, and operations like convolutions, although they are completely differently defined for graphs. Also, one potential forward method, which is very simple, starts two layers one after the other and you also see the use of the nonlinear activation function uh, relevant. Don't forget that DGL is still in development and try to um, uh, you know, uh, things that are already in the tutorial. So graph neural networks LRP is quite similar uh, in principle with the things that I've shown you before about LRP in con fully connected neural networks. Um, the result of LRP is not a heat map right now. It's a collection of relevant walks on the input graph. It's just not presenting relevances of individual nodes and edges. And this is good in particular in applications. Um, where uh, the user sees relevance of the parts uh, of uh, the graph where one node is not just relevant because it's alone relevant, it's relevant because it's probably connected with another relevant node or because its edges are uh, particularly relevant and not separately, not individually. Um, each walk is assigned with a relevance score and their constraints as in the normal uh, and simple LRP case for the fully connected case uh, that uh, we have linear or well activation functions but there are no constraints about how the structure of the graph neural network uh, will be or the underlying graph. Um, one can validate that the model uses the graph structure meaningfully with those explanations, but the downside is that one has to search over many possible paths. One can imagine the graph can grow in size very quickly. So, for one particular walk, there's the length of the walk order Taylor expansion, which is um, the one that's very similar to the LRP um, for fully connected neural networks. And the root point um, L tilde is very difficult to find, but it's shown in the paper that if the function of the output is relu, then uh, we can use this um, L tilde is quite similar or as multiplication, small multiplication with some constant of the original lambda matrix that presents the, the adjacency matrix of the um, operations. And we can also simplify the Taylor expansions by that. The question is now what um, this adjacency matrix will look like and how will that make uh, sense and what does it represent, which is an ongoing work. And again, we have conservation properties um, to validate our results, but there's no exercise here because we need to also um, have the implementation to uh, work with that in a proper way. Now let's go to the detailed description of the main task. The task contains two parts as I said in the beginning. There's one numerical task where you use the equations that are presented above to compute numerically the relevance of all layers of the network depicted in the picture of uh, in the figure of uh, page 11 and you can use your own weight values but 
think on waiting schemes that are typically used in neural networks. Some students also used already uh, initializers that they have learned from Keras and initialized the weights accordingly. Um, verify please that the conservation positivity rules properties apply to check the correctness of your results on paper. And it's very important that we as humans, that we can provide descriptions of those interpretations and we can see if the results do make sense or not which is quite tricky. Um, the programmatic task uh, needs for you to install Python 3 plus and some relevant libraries to run the investigate library and provide please again descriptions of the interpretations of relevance uh, images, heat maps with respect to the input images as well as their differences. The Python libraries that you will need for solving this task is the backends, which is can be TensorFlow or MXNet. I personally tested it in TensorFlow. Keras is also a requirement and you can find in this GitHub of in the investigate uh, tool what uh, are the versions that you can use in Keras and in TensorFlow to run this. Please run the code in the example sections. Put an image of your um, wish, which is also found in the example images folder. And then I'll tap the particular line to select the different analyzer and also see how different analyzers uh, change the influences of the resulting heat map appearance as well as the interpretation that you need to do. I strongly encourage the use of Python IDE uh, for better development, um, the PyCharm, but you can also send us uh, Jupyter notebooks if you want to. Um, for the bonus task, you can use the GDL library. This is also a Python library. I've installed it and run it in Linux. I've came to see that there are problems uh, in Windows if one doesn't have all the DLL files of the Microsoft Visual Studio, which can be very uh, time consuming. But in Linux, I had no problems. I have run all the code and examples in Python 3.7. I used CUDA 10.2 and the QDNN 7.6.5 and I run the examples in TensorFlow GPU as my backend with Torch 1.6 and Torch Reason 0.7. The DGL that I used is one of the latest for this particular CUDA version. So please just follow the steps presented in the tutorial in the training section. This is chapter 5. I strongly encourage to also read and experiment with the previous chapters. Um, use one dataset that is provided by the digital data, digital dataset, or just create your own graphs and specific features and see what you can do. Don't forget to split the dataset into training, validation, and test sets with the use of masks as they are defined in the examples of DGL. And you can create a simple GNN with a simple graph input that performs node edge classification or regression, link prediction or graph classification. Please beware, as the tutorial says, that if you do graph classification, you will usually need more than one uh, graphs in your dataset to do this. In the literature, I encourage strongly for those who don't have a background in neural networks, the book of Duda and Hart, Pattern Classification. Uh, most things you will find in Chapter 6, but of course I encourage you to also read the previous ones. It's free on GitHub and Christopher Bishops is also free for anyone who wants to learn not only just neural networks but also have a background in probability theory needed in machine learning, Bayesian networks and the fourth. Um, LRP is presented in very much detail in the work of Gregor Montavo explaining nonlinear classification decisions with deep tailor decomposition and for the bonus task I can also uh, show you four papers about how to explain graph neural network prediction, but first one needs to have practical experience in learning how graph neural networks work before one goes there. There are two books for those who are interested in graph neural network representations that I can provide uh, on demand, and but there is not one book that I can recommend or one source that I can recommend for graph neural network since this is an ongoing topic. Thank you and I will be happy to answer your questions.